Hi guys, this is Erica Weston with Fox Sports Midwest, and you're listening to my favorite St. Louis Blues hockey podcast, Let's Go Blues Radio. Hi there, everyone. I'm Haley Wickenheiser, and this is Let's Go Blues Radio, past to the future. And we are back with the past portion of ba- uh, Past to the Future. Let's go Blues Radio. And uh, today I'm joined by Phil McRae, a former St. Louis Blues draft pick, uh, 2008 second round, number 33 overall. Uh, you also may remember his father, uh, Basil McRae, played for the Blues from 1992 to 19. 19- I'm sorry, 1992-93 to 95. 95- 96. Uh, but uh, more importantly, Phil has uh, played 10 years of professional hockey, played with the Peoria Rivermen most notably, but has also played with the Chicago Wolves. And then uh, we'll get into some of his international play as well. Uh, Phil, thank you very much for joining the show. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. I uh, appreciate it. Do you go by Phil or Philip? Uh, Phil is fine. You know, usually okay. uh, Philip, if it's something, you know, formal, but. You know, Phil, Phil, for the most part. We're not very formal on this show, so we'll go with Phil. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, so first of all, I wanted to ask you about, so you were born in uh, in Minnesota, um, and then uh, that was obviously where your dad was playing when that happened, and then you moved to St. Louis. Uh, I believe you moved to Chesterfield, which is where you are now. Um, what, what, did, what were your first, I mean, obviously you were a kid, but what was the impression on the McRae family that St. Louis made? Well, you know, I was pretty young, so I don't, I don't remember my, my initial thoughts, but I just remember, you know, one thing about St. Louis that, that I really enjoyed and that my family, my parents really enjoyed was we were in a great neighborhood in Chesterfield. We had awesome neighbors, a uh, great group of kids. It just seemed like a, a really good, really good place to raise a family. And I think that's part of the reason why when my father did retire from playing, you know, him and my mom are both Canadian, but they made the decision to, to stay put in St. Louis and raise our family here. So, um, you know, they, they moved uh, a while back and they live in Columbus now, but they really miss St. Louis. And I wouldn't be surprised if one day they, they make the move back here. Yeah, let's hope we, we have a plenty of uh, Blues alumni. As you mentioned, you had dinner last night and saw Bernie Federko out. So it's funny, wherever you go in the city, it, it seems like you run into uh, – Blues or Cardinals alumni. So, yes, yeah, definitely a great spot for that. Um, I wanted to ask you about your dad uh, before we get started talking about your career. Um, first of all, I think the most important burning question that we could have for you is how close of friends is he with Gordon Bombay? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's still that's still kind of his claim to fame that, that <laughs> his little cameo there in the Mighty Ducks. And he always tells a pretty funny story that um, – you know, when they have the scene with him and Mike Medano, Mike Medano was supposed to do all the talking. And, you know, my dad, Basil, was supposed to be North Star, too, who didn't really say much. But Mike couldn't remember any of the lines. So after about (laughs) 30 minutes, they had to flip flop because my dad had to get home for dinner. So they swapped and uh, Basil got to do a lot of the talking there with with Gordon Bombay. So, but yeah, that still his claim to fame. And uh it's pretty cool that he got, got to be in that movie. So do you have a lot of friends that, um, you know, growing up, like I said, you were here in St. Louis. I'm sure a lot of your friends watched that movie. Uh, is, did they always kind of reference him as Gordon Bombay's best friend that gave him the shot in the minors? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, when I was playing youth hockey growing up, the kids always used to mess around that. When were we going to, you know, practice the flying V and, <laughs> And, you know, learn the knuckle puck and some of those type of things. So, um, yeah, you know, some people, you know, don't really realize that he was even in the movie. And then, you know, once they go back and watch it, it's uh, it's pretty funny to see now. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, that's uh, no, we, I made my son, my eight year old son, watch it the other day. And I thought, oh, hey, I'm actually going to be talking to to his son here pretty soon. 
Um, but uh, but no, obviously your father known for more than just being on the Mighty Ducks. One hell of a hockey player. Um, a tough guy, tough as nails. Once registered 351 penalty minutes in one season, and that was for the North, North Stars, 1989-1990. Um, knowing the type of player he was, and then as you were moving up the ranks and you knew that there was a chance you might get drafted in the NHL, did you ever feel like you had to live up to his way of playing, or did you kind of develop your own game? Uh, no, not really. I think, you know, he, he coached me almost all the way up through when I was playing youth hockey in St. Louis for the Chesterfield Falcons and then the AAA Blues. And he was always, uh, you know, really big on the skill side of the game and uh, passing, puck handling. He, he never really encouraged the, the, the fighting or the, the physical side as much. So, I think, you know, he always told me that I was my own player and, you know, to, to do my own thing and not necessarily try to try to play the same way he did. And, um, you know, first of all, the type of player he was, I know I could never be that anyways. He was way tougher than, you know, I could ever be. But, um, you know, also, I think the game has obviously changed and evolved. You know, it's a different game now than it was when he was playing in the 80s and 90s. So, um, you know, but one thing. I think a lot of people don't know about my dad is that he was a really good player. And I think he had 30 goals in junior one year, 20 goals in the American hockey league, but he was one of those guys that, you know, knew he wasn't necessarily going to make it as a, as a top six forward in the NHL. So he did what he had to do and he changed his game and, and was able to find a role that, you know, allowed him to play 15 years in the NHL. So it's not easy to do that. Um, and he found a way to, to put together a really good career. Yeah, um, we were always in my family, big fans of your dad. Uh, I remember my dad always saying, son, if you ever make it to the NHL, I want you to be the next Basil McRae. And I'm like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that, but uh, I'll do my best. So, yeah, I, I we were always big supporters of his. And, and uh, when you got drafted, I remember that was a big deal in St. Louis because um, your dad holds a, a pretty special name, I think with, uh, with blues fans, my age and older. So, um, but I wanted to talk to you again about, uh, about your playing days more. So obviously you said you grew up here in St. Louis, you played for the AAA blues, you played for the Chesterfield Falcons. Um, most importantly though, you played with CBC in the 0405 season. And, uh, and of course you could just take a guess how CBC finished. If you didn't know mid States high school hockey champions, um, what do you remember about making it all the way as a hockey champion for mid states in Missouri? And um, how good was that team you played on? Yeah, we had a great team. Um, I know for me, um, I really wanted to go go to CBC because of the hockey team there, and they had a lot of good older players: um, Kyle O'Kane, um, Corey Spradling, Grant Gorsica. They had a, a lot of those junior senior guys that were playing junior B or, or triple A. So we had a pretty good team and uh, it was a fun experience. Um, you know, sometimes you, you didn't necessarily get to make all the games if you had if you had triple A at the same same time or something. But um, the coach there, John Jost, was great to myself and it was a lot of fun. And, you know, that was a really fun season for me my last year playing you know, kind of minor hockey in St. Louis, our triple A blues team won the national championship. We won the state championship for CBC and the CBC roller hockey team. I was on it. We won state as well. So it was a, it was a fun year all around. So you, uh, you, you I was going to ask you that if you played roller here in St. Louis, I have friends in New Jersey that uh, I mentioned roller hockey and they say, Oh, where do you play in the 1990s? So uh, do you still play roller hockey? Is that still a thing for you? Yeah, it is. Um, I, you know, I know a lot of the players coming up through St. Louis were unbelievable roller hockey players. I was never very good. That <laughs> CBC high school team I played on, we had some, some, some stud roller hockey players, and I was pretty much riding the bench. But um, I played, you know, growing up and – a few years went by where I didn't play as much when I was still playing pro, but actually last summer we put a team together for a men's league out at Queenie Park, uh, and we had a pretty stacked team with ice hockey players. Myself, uh, Ryan McKinnis, the Weidman brothers, Travis Turnbull, um, Michael Hunterbrinker. 
we had all ice hockey players that were pretty much playing pro. And we didn't really do very well because it is a different game. And, you know, four on four with no offsides and the other team would be zipping it around. So um, I still play, but uh, it's, it's a d- different game, but I think it's great for your hands and to work on your skills. What, uh, what night did you guys play up there? Do you remember? I don't remember what night it was. It was up at Queenie Park. Uh, you know, obviously Perry Turnbull owns oh, yeah. the rink. So, so Travis was able to to throw a team in the men's pro division, and maybe we we should have stepped down one division with the way it went. But it was a lot of fun. I was gonna say because I play up there. Uh, I was playing up there on Wednesdays and Sundays, so I, I probably saw you up there at some point. And didn't realize it, but uh, I don't think I ever played against you because if you you say you're bad, you should see me play. It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, you uh, you played for CBC in 0405. You move on to play for the uh, London Knights of the OHL, and then uh, eventually your last season in the OHL traded to the Plymouth Whalers. Uh, what was the step up from high school to playing in the OHL like for you? Well, I think for me, actually, when I left from, from St. Louis, I went to the National Team Development Program That's right. for one year first. So that was a, a, a good stepping stone, I think. Um, the program there had a lot of mentorship and, you know, a lot of hands-on training and a lot of guidance. Um, and then, you know, I was there for one year. And then when I went to London, it was more, a little more closer to the pro game where, you know, you do what you have to do. And, you know, the, the, the bottom line was winning. And um, I think London is one of the, if not the best junior programs in the world, some of the players they've developed. And it was a great experience. I got a chance to play with some really good players there. My first year we had Pat Kane, Sam Gagne. Then we had John Tavares, uh, John Carlson, Nazem Kadri. We had a lot of good players come through there those three years. And, um, you know, unfortunately we didn't win a championship, but we had some, some pretty good years and, um, I think just getting the chance to learn from Mark and Dale Hunter kind of about, you know, what it's like to be a pro. And um, the main thing for me that they taught me that I didn't know yet was how important being an all around player is in the defensive side of the game. And when you're playing, you know, as a kid growing up, you just want to score goals and play offense, offense. But when you get to junior, you have to be able to play both sides of the puck. And that was a, a really big thing that, that Dale um, emphasized. So uh, kind of talking about your career as a whole, when you look back and, and maybe even today, uh, what do you think is the strongest part of your game? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's a tough one because <laughs> some years were good and some years weren't so good. So I think for me, I, I always like, to, uh, you know, just uh, try and make my line mates better and, um, I think, you know, being a playmaker and making good passes and at the same time being responsible defensively, winning face-offs, I think as a centerman, you just try and be the strongest all-around player you can be. Um, you know, for me, I think some of my biggest weaknesses through my career, the consistency, I think that's, you know, one of the things that's the biggest difference when you're in the American Hockey League. To get from the American Hockey League to the NHL, there's a lot of great players in the AHL, but the guys that are the most consistent, you know, are the ones that are going to, going to make it to the next level for myself. I had, I had games where I played great and I had games where I was invisible. So, you know, the, the good players, they have great games and then they have the games where they're not so good. They're still pretty good. So the coach can rely on them. They know what they're going to get. You know, the two things for me is, consistency and also just the ability to adapt and maybe change your role. Um, it took me probably too, longer than longer than I wish it would have to realize, you know, I was never going to play in the NHL as an offensive player or a top six forward. You know, the guys that are really good players but aren't necessarily going to make it in that top six role, if they can, you know, figure out a way to change their game and, and find find you know, a, a specific skill set that, that they have, whether it's blocking shots, winning faceoffs, killing penalties, being a checker, a shutdown guy. Um, you know, I think that's that's one of the things that gets those guys from the from the AHL to the NHL. 
Um, so again, you uh, you drafted by the Blues in 2008, second round. Um, was was were the I'm guessing the Blues were your team growing up, um, despite your dad playing kind of all over. Um, and but you know, living here in St. Louis, going to high school out here, I'm sure all your friends are Blues fans. What did that mean for you to be drafted by your hometown team? Yeah, it was. Um, when my dad was playing, my my favorite player was was Bobby Basson. Oh yes. And, uh, and then as I got a little older, my favorite player, you know, I was obsessed with Tyson Nash. Mm-hmm. I love Tyson Nash. I always wore number nine because of Tyson Nash. So, you know, when the draft did come, of course, every every player hopes to go to their hometown. Um, it's, it's a dream to be drafted at all, but to get picked by your hometown is pretty special. And um, it was an awesome feeling. It, you know, obviously your dream is to, to play – for your hometown team when you're a kid playing in the driveway, you know, you're, you're winning a cup for your hometown team. So it was, it was pretty special. And, um, you know, to get a chance to, to play a handful of games with them was really my childhood dream coming true. So something I'll never forget. Um, so I wanted to ask you kind of looking back, um, you said you were happy to be drafted by your hometown team, but everybody is, we had Carlo Koliakovo on the show and he talked about how, as special it was for him to be drafted by uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, his hometown team. But if you look back, do you feel like you should have gotten a – if it would have been better for you to get a fresh start somewhere else, or would you – if you could go back and change it, would you? Would you rather still be uh, uh, drafted by the St. Louis Blues? No, I don't I don't think I would have wanted to change anything because at the end of the day, I still got to, to play – um, National Hockey League and sport a goal in the NHL. And, you know, if you go somewhere else, you, you don't know. Maybe that doesn't happen and you never play a game. So, um, but I think, you know, for me in St. Louis, it got to a point where I think I did need maybe a fresh start. And, and that's when I, I went and tried the year in Europe, went to Finland. Um, but, you know, definitely there's a lot of positives and great things about being drafted by your home hometown team. But, uh, maybe there's a there's some things that you know maybe a little more pressure. There's some some more distractions. Maybe you have your 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 friends pulling you every which way, and you know you're training here in the summer. There's a lot going on, and um, maybe there's a couple more challenges. But I think for the most part, more positives than negatives for sure. So um, you know the way I look at it is. I got to play in the NHL, and if I would have went to a different organization, maybe that doesn't happen. So, uh, so one of the, the bigger parts, I would think, of your career, and we haven't even mentioned yet, was in 2010, you were on uh, the Team USA Under-20 team, and uh, you were a gold medalist. What was that experience like? Yeah, that's probably really the highlight of my career as far as you know winning a championship and I was lucky enough to play for USA for the under 17s and under 18s and kind of go through the program a little bit. And obviously the world juniors is really the big one at the end of of your junior career. And it was a great experience, not only to win a gold medal, but to beat Canada in the gold medal game in overtime in Canada was pretty awesome. So um, John Carlson was able to get the overtime winner there for us. I think actually Jake Allen was in net for Canada. So um, you know, it, it was a, it was a cool experience and we had a lot of players from that team that are doing really well right now in the NHL. Yeah. Oh yeah. Look at that roster. It's chalked full of players like that. You mentioned playing with guys like Patrick Kane and John Tavares. Those guys are storming the league now too. So you definitely have, uh, played with your fair share of, of top talent, um, in the NHL, but, uh, after the, uh, the gold medal, you joined the Peoria Rivermen in 2010, 2011, um, and, uh, we'll get to your call up to the blues in a second, but, uh, I know Peoria fairly well, uh, back when Peoria was the blues minor league team. I went up there a ton to, to see Rivermen games just because, uh, I, I loved the atmosphere. What was your favorite part of, uh, being in Peoria? Yeah. And props for the hat that you were in Rivermen. Hat yeah. too. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, my favorite part of looking back at Peoria was just the guys that I played with there. We had a really tight team. Um, you know, the American Hockey League's a development league with a lot of young players. We had, I think, six or seven rookies my rookie year. So we had a lot of 1990 birth years. And 
the crazy thing about it was we were all for the most part OHL guys. Um, Anthony Niagro, uh, Mark Kandari, Della Rover, Anthony Peluso. We had a group of guys that we all knew each other even before we turned pro. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, Jared Bedner was a great first coach to have in pro. He was a great teacher. Um, I think he helped me out a lot uh, my first couple of years there. And uh, yeah, it was it was a really good time. The fan base there wasn't the biggest, but they were loyal and they loved their hockey team. So um, I was happy to see that when when the Rivermen, you know, moved from the AHL to Chicago, that Peoria still kept a pro team there with the SPHL. So I think I think Peoria is a great hockey city. Yeah, I agree. It, it's uh, you mentioned the SPHL. I went up and saw a game. I think it was last season and. It seems like those loyal fans, they're all still there. So um, hopefully that continues because, I, as, a, as I said, I, I love Peoria as well. It's a beautiful city. Uh, the outdoor patio for Steak and Shake is something that uh, yeah. is, is you don't find anywhere else. So I love it. <laughs> yeah, I um, wish I could say I never, never sat on that patio, but yeah, I've right. been, been there a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um. So, uh, again, you're with Peoria. You uh, got your first NHL call-up that season, 2010-2011. I'm going to ask you some trivia here, some trivia about yourself. I'm sure you're going to remember all these. When was your first NHL game? Oh, maybe you don't know. It was in February, I think, of of, uh, 2011. But I, I know it was obviously it was in Anaheim against the Ducks. Timu Solani was in the lineup for the Ducks. Corey Perry was, um, you know, but I don't remember the actual date. I want to say, you know, February 20th. January 12th is what NHL.com tells me. Yep. Yeah. So so what was that like? I mean, obviously, that is quite the achievement to even get to the NHL and play any amount of games. But making it up, and then you said, playing against some of these guys like Timu Solani in your first game? I mean, seeing them across the ice in warmups, uh, what was going through your mind when that happened? It was, it, honestly, it was a blur. Um, my first <laughs> game, my parents flew out there for the game and uh, it happened pretty quick. I think the Blues had uh, two or three forwards go down in a week and they they had a lot of injuries and I got called up with Ryan Reeves actually at the time and it was like, 24 hours later, we were in the lineup and uh, it was a bit of a blur, but I just remember my first shift, I took a penalty. You know, went flying in on the four check, went after the puck, took a tripping penalty. You know, I was, I was pretty nervous, obviously. And then, you know, a- after a period went by, I was able to, to settle down a little bit. Um, unfortunately, we lost the game, but um, it was it was something I'll never forget. And people always think it was kind of ironic that my first game was against the Anaheim Ducks, you know, with Basil and uh, the Mighty Ducks and that whole kind of story. <laughs> How do you think about that? That's a good point. <laughs> right. um, so I wanted to ask you, like, when you do the – when you take the penalty and that happens, are you worried that, oh, no, the coach isn't going to like this? Uh, I'm going to get sent down right away. Is that kind of stuff crossing your mind or are you just trying to play the game and not worry about that kind of stuff? Um, I'm not, not, not really worrying about that at all during the game. You're just trying to, to basically work as hard as you possibly can make the best first impression you can and, um, basically stay up as long as you can. So, so you, uh, well, it, also, your first NHL goal came just a couple weeks later in Calgary, uh, January 26th. Uh, do you remember everything about that play? Yeah, that I do. Um, uh, in Calgary, you know, Dave McClement made a, went in on the forecheck, made a great play driving the puck to the net and uh, loose rebound in front, and I was able to bang it in past Mika Kiprasov. Um you know, that's one thing when you only have one goal in the NHL, you don't forget it. <laughs> yep. No, I, so. I've talked to many players who still, you know, scored 
a hundred goals and they remember everything about their first goal. So pretty cool. You're able to experience that in a blues Jersey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was something I'll never forget. And actually I was able to get the puck and I have the puck in a nice frame here in my house. So, um, you know, something I'll have forever. Oh, that's good. Um, so your first home game was, was right in the middle of that. Do you remember getting a pretty nice reception from the St. Louis crowd? You know, that one again was, that was, that was kind of a blur. I, I think I was actually more nervous for the home game than my first game. Um, because so many, you know, friends, friends there. And obviously that's the building you went to as a kid watching them play. And when that kind of blues music plays and you're walking through the tunnel, it, it, I had goosebumps and chills and, um, honestly don't, don't even really remember much. It was just a blur, but um again something that i'll never forget and you know walking out of that tunnel for a game is what you dream about when you are playing roller hockey in the driveway when you're a kid so it was pretty pretty special so again uh you played in minnesota on march 26th and and i'm i'm asking you this because that's again your father was a big part of the north stars um that was obviously where he was in the mighty ducks movie but uh also where you were born uh, did you get? Do you remember again getting a warm reception from anybody in Minnesota when you first stepped on the ice? Actually, there was a lot of people, rink staff, and um, that kind of made comments to me that maybe they they had even been you know working for the for the team back when they were the North Stars. And then there was a couple fans that leaned over and, and made comments like, "We loved your dad, Razzle Dazzle Basil." So I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Made sure to, to to tell him all that stuff after the game. Uh, so you go back to Peoria the next season uh, for two more seasons, actually. Then you played for the Chicago Wolves in 2014, 2015. Uh, you kind of bounced around the AHL a little bit after that. Then you signed with uh, a team in, in Europe. And again, we'll talk about your European career. But uh, what made you decide to, to go overseas? Well, for me, after my third year... Um, in the American Hockey League, after three years in Peoria, I went to Finland for one year. That decision was more of a, a change of scenery and just try a different path for, for my development. And the plan was always to go there for one year and then come back, which is what I did. You know, went to Finland for one year, came back, um, joined the Chicago Wolves in the AHL. And then after, I think, three more years in the AHL, the next decision when I made to go back to Finland, I knew that was going to be, you know, when I go back to Europe, I'm going for good. And at that point in your career, it's more about just going, going over there for a life experience, um, you know, experience in different cultures, live in, live in different cities, different countries, um, more of a life experience than anything. At that point, I think I was 26 or 27 and, the window had kind of closed in North America. So uh, my wife and I said, let's go bounce around some different countries in Europe for a few years and just enjoy it. So that's what we did and was able to live in three different countries my last three years. And it was a really good experience. Um, the nice thing about Europe is once you're over there, it's, it's fairly easy and cheap to travel. So um, anytime you have a day off, you can jump on the train and um, you know, rip over to a different country and, you know, have dinner out in, in a new city. <laughs> so, um, you, uh, you played for a team. I have to ask if it was an intentional, you played for a team in Finland called the blues. What's the deal with that? <laughs> no, just, just, just totally coincidence. Um, yeah, pretty funny how that worked out, but um, yeah, the Espo Blues. Espo is a city just outside of Helsinki, the capital of Finland. And my apartment was actually right downtown Helsinki. So they had a brand new building, great fans. Um, it was a great experience. Um, probably my favorite, favorite year in Europe was probably that year for the Espo Blues. So would you say that was your favorite, one of your favorite places to play hockey in as well? Yeah, it was, um, you know, obviously Chicago was an awesome city. They have a great fan base there for the Chicago Wolves for an AHL team. Um, Espo, I really enjoyed. And then last year um, in the Czech Republic, 
I was in a city called Zenoimo and we were about an hour from Prague and an hour from Vienna. And that, that city was an awesome city and being so close to Vienna and Prague was unbelievable to go up there, you know, once a week and, you know, walk around and have lunch or dinner in those cities. That was a pretty awesome year as well. I was dreading having to pronounce that city name. So thank you very much for saying it for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> Zanoimo, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It looks like it's Zanjimo, but yeah, you pronounce it Zanoimo. Okay. Um, so yeah, you played for the Wild Wings of the uh, DEL in there. You also, as you mentioned, played for uh, Zanoimo and the uh, EBHL in Austria. Um, so you've been all over the place. I mean, again, if this, if somebody's following your career path, if there's somebody, a young player who, uh, you know, is making his way to the NHL, plays in the NHL, and then is considering him hawing, going over to Europe, uh, what would your suggestion to that player be? Well, you know, first of all, I, I would, I would suggest that, you know, they really make sure they're ready to make the move over to Europe because, when you get into your your kind of late twenties, once you go over to Europe, it's going to be really hard to get back, you know, in into North America. So make sure you're ready to make that jump, and um, really just do do your research before you go over there. Obviously, um, there's different leagues, different cities. Um, you know, some are a little more professional than others, and some of the cities are, you know, obviously nicer than others. So just make sure you do your homework before you go. But, you know, I, I loved it for, for anyone that, you know, is kind of getting to the end of their career in North America, like I was, I think it's a great, great chance to go over and experience a different culture and meet new people and, you know, put yourself into, into kind of a, a new life experience. So um, I, I have to ask, since you're a St. Louis boy, uh, you were playing over in, um, in, in Europe when the Blues won the Stanley Cup. Uh, were you able to make it back in town for any of the games or anything like that, or did you have to watch from afar? Yeah, actually, the seasons in Europe are earlier. So, you know, typically when I was playing in Europe, I had to leave in July. Hmm. And playoffs start March 1st. So um, that year, uh, we didn't even make playoffs. So I was home for the whole for the whole playoff run, and I went to um, I went to Game Six at home uh, against the Bruins. Um, so I was at Game Six, and then you know when the Blues won the Cup, I was just like any other St. Louis fan downtown celebrating had a group of group of friends down there and we uh, we bounced around a few spots and you know enjoyed it with uh, with the rest of the city it was you know unbelievable unbelievable experience was really happy and obviously uh, I got to play with some of the players that were able to win the cup so to see some of the guys that I played with in the AHL uh, Jaden Schwartz um, obviously Jordan Bennington Joel Edmondson you know, I was with those guys when they were grinding in the AHL. So to see them win the Stanley Cup, I was really happy for them. You uh, still talk to any of those guys on occasion? Yeah, a little bit. Um, kind of lose touch over the years because, you know, every year, you know, you're, you're playing with a group of new guys and um, you lose touch a little bit. But, you know, if I see them around the rinks and stuff, you know, always, uh, always nice to catch up with any, any old teammates. Right. Um, do you still talk to any of the other, uh, the St. Louis kids that, that made their way to the NHL? You mentioned, um, uh, well, we, we talked about Anthony Peluso, but, um, you know, Brandon Bullig, any of those types of guys. You ever talk to any of them? Yeah, you know, obviously St. Louis has come a long way with, with the, the players that are making it. And um, I actually lived with uh, Keith Kachuk, and, you know, his family for a couple of years when I was younger in the summers. So I know Matthew and Brady pretty well. Um, and just just from training in the summer, uh, our group last summer, we had uh, Trent Frederick, Logan Brown, Ryan McInnes, um, trained with Clayton Keller one summer. 
So, you know, the hockey community in St. Louis, obviously it's getting bigger and there's more kids making it, but it's still, you know, small enough where we're all skating together and working out together. And now that I'm retired, I'm usually leaving the gym as that whole group's walking in, but uh, still, get to see them, still get to kind of see them and see how they're doing. Um, so I want to talk to you about uh, your your post playing career. So you, uh, you you mentioned that you were playing up until this last season. Uh, you decided to come home to St. Louis, and now you're with uh, Total Package Hockey. So tell me about your decision to want to join them. You mentioned that uh, it was something that you were kind of hoping you would be in line for, and then also uh, tell me about Total Package Hockey, what they do, and and what people can expect from them. <clears throat> yeah. So for me. First of all, I always loved the the development side of the game, the individual skills. I think I got that from even my dad when he was, you know, helping me out when I was a kid. Um, and then just playing in those development leagues like the AHL and the leagues in Europe, there was a lot of emphasis on the development and the individual skills of the young players to help get them to the next level. So I always really enjoyed that. And the last couple of years, I did some camps and clinics and did some lessons. And especially last summer, um, I ran two full one week camps with 2007 and 2006 birth year players. And last summer, I really noticed my passion starting to change. I was I was more excited to get to the rink to help them develop their game than I was to go to the rink to develop my own game. So I kind of knew I was, I was getting ready to make that transition. And uh, so when I was playing in the Czech Republic last year, I actually got encouraged to, to put my resume in for total package hockey. And I didn't really know too much about it. Um, did my homework on it and I was pretty intrigued. So as I kind of went through the hiring process and made some presentations to the hiring committee, I, I really felt that, the the center of excellence academy style school that was coming to st louis really was the best platform to to develop and to mentor and to help these kids grow so the more i kind of went down the process the more i i really really wanted to get the position and being from st louis knowing the, the entire youth hockey organization how it works i really felt it was a model that was missing in st louis and that would really help strengthen the programs here. Um, you know, one thing about the TPH Center of Excellence that's coming to St. Louis, uh, there's 10 academy style schools in the US. A lot of the other programs, they're paired up with a specific club or they have their own TPH team. I felt it was important in St. Louis not to go that route and to be just the school and accept kids from all the organizations because I know we have great organizations in St. Louis already. Um, you know, AAA Blues, Car Shield, Lady Blues, Central States programs. So I, I wanted to be be an organization that that helps them develop their players, not necessarily competes with them to to get players and that type of thing. So that's kind of how it all came together. Um, what what the center of excellence is? We're an academy style school for student athletes, boys and girls, grades six to grade 12, playing hockey at a triple A or tier one double A level. Um, the entire school is based out of Centene Community Ice Center. So the whole idea behind it is um, these students are gonna get the ideal balance athletically, academically, and socially. Um, athletically, we have on ice development daily, as well as their off ice training. Um, academically, you know, they're gonna get their, their academics right there at Centene. We use an online learning platform with on site infrastructure there to kind of hold them accountable, help them set their schedule, um, put them in the right learning environment. And then socially, you know, they're gonna be with these other student athletes on a daily basis, other motivated, driven, like-minded individuals with similar goals and aspirations. Um, and they're gonna be competing with each other, motivating each other and, and help helping each other on a daily basis. So, um, you know, I think one of the things for me that 
really caught my attention was the academic side and the flexibility for an elite student athlete. A lot of these kids now, they're missing a lot of Fridays for tournaments, out of town games, Thursday, Fridays. And this learning platform gives them the ability to to have a customized schedule. So if they are gonna be out of town Thursday and Friday, our academic director can front load their schedule so they're caught up before they leave. And at the same time, if they are in Detroit for a tournament, they can still get their coursework from the road because they just need their laptop and the internet. So, you know, that was one thing. Another thing is a lot of these student athletes now, they're doing their private skating lessons or, or power skating before school at 6 a.m. Then they're going to school all day long. Then they have their off-ice training after school. Then their club practice at night. So this is a way for them to really get everything they need as an elite student athlete from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And when their day ends at 4, they've gotten everything they need athletically, academically, and then they're going to have time for their social life and to be a kid and to, and to get the proper rest and recovery that they need as well. So um, it's, that's really what it's geared, geared around. And, you know, right now, we have uh, 17 student athletes fully enrolled for the upcoming school year, and we have about 27 that have applied. So, you know, we're aiming for that 25 to 30 student athlete range in year one. And, uh, you know, it looks like we're right about on track. So it's going pretty well. And I've really enjoyed it so far. I'm a huge believer in the model for a bunch of different reasons. And, you know, the main thing I thought when I when I looked into the model was, wow, I wish they had this when I was a kid. Yeah, I would no have kidding. Loved no kidding. So, yeah. So that's kind yeah. of a big, big picture of it. Um, we put a great staff together. You know, myself as the director, our academic director is Rachel Moore, who played Division One field hockey at SLU before she was the academic director for over 200 student athletes at Lindenwood. And she really wanted to work with younger student athletes in a smaller number so she could make a more positive and larger impact. So I think it's a great fit for her. Um, Bruce Racine is our goalie coach. And then uh, our player development coach we've recently hired is Bobby Feaster, who was the manager last year for the Manitoba Moose in the AHL and did his internship with the Columbus Blue Jackets and, you know, has a lot of experience with the, the analytical side of the game. So, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about it. And like I said, I think it was something St. Louis was missing. And I think, um, you know, it's going to be a great development option for the student athletes that do attend. Certainly not for everyone. Um, you know, it's really for those student athletes that have that real strong passion for hockey, goals and dreams to play junior one day, to play college, to play in the NHL. And really we're geared towards helping our student athletes get to that level, junior and college, but also having them prepared to have success when they do get there. So we have a large emphasis on daily habits, lifestyle skills, character traits, time management, all the things that are gonna make them successful in hockey, in school, but just in life in general. Um, you know, hockey's what gets them in our front door, but it's the academics and the character traits that are gonna get them out the back door. So um, that's kind of the, the whole kind of big picture of the program. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, like you said, when I was a kid, it was 6 a.m. practice, 7.30, go to school, and then maybe we had a game that night. And, you know, I'm sure your schedule was even more rigorous because you were actually had aspirations of, of taking your game farther. So for even for someone like me who just wanted to play for the high school team, um, that's something that, that was missing for me because, you know, it, it was, like you said, it's something that would have helped supplement my not only my skills on the ice but my ability to kind of manage time and uh learn academically everything i needed to know so um this is something i agree with you and this is a big reason i wanted to have you on the show phil was because this is something that was has been missing from st louis um, you know we've got hockey schools out here we've got programs that are great at helping kids but there are so many other aspects of of being even just a junior player that nobody thinks about. And so having someone like you who's been through it and then um, just, you know, you mentioned Rachel Moore, everybody else, it's a huge deal. 
And um, I, I, I think the from what I've seen, granted this is new to St. Louis, but from what I've seen, it's it's a model I believe in as well. And I'm uh, really happy to welcome you guys to St. Louis. It's very cool that you guys are here. Um, so let me go and ask then, where, uh, how can, if there's a parent listening, if there's a student listening right now, um, how can they go about getting them signed up for Total Package Hockey? Uh, you can go to totalpackagehockey.com. Um, then you can go to, you know, you can check it out and lots of info on there, but there, you can go to regions. There'll be the 10 regions uh, where we have the, the academy schools. You would click on St. Louis and, and request more information and, and you'd go from there. There's there's an application process and, you know, myself, I, I interview the student athletes and, and ask them about their short-term goals, long-term goals, what they really hope to get out of the center of excellence if they do attend. Um, you know, we have a meeting with the family and, and of course, Rachel, you know, learns about the student as a student, their strengths and weaknesses in the classroom and, and really start to build a relationship. And, and then you go from there. So, um, you know, I think another, another thing for me that I really like about the model for St. Louis is there's a lot of great players in St. Louis that they feel like they have to leave St. Louis maybe earlier than they need to at 14, 15 years old, especially on the girls side to go to places like Shattuck, St. Mary and Culver and some of these East coast academies and prep schools. And I think with the center of excellence paired with their triple a club, whether it's lady blues, triple a blues, car shield, whatever it might be, the center of excellence paired up with that club. It's a development option now that, they're going to get what they need and they can stay home until they're really ready to, to leave, you know, physically maturity wise to go to the USHL or the OHL or whatever it might be. So I think it'll, it'll, it'll be a development option that will allow some of these players to stay home a little longer as well. Yeah. I think that's uh, a lot of parents are going to love that because uh, I know that uh, there's been a lot of players. I mean, Bernie Federico's book, mentioned um how he wanted to go play in saskatchewan uh for the the big province team but his family didn't want him to leave and so uh, something like this you don't have to leave you can stay here you can work on your schooling you can work on your hockey you don't have to go anywhere and i think that's a, a very important aspect of uh tph hockey so um again very happy to have them involved here in St. Louis, and uh, you mentioned the website, totalpackagehockey.com. Um, can they interact with you at all? If anybody wants to interact with you on social media, or um, you know, is there anywhere people can find you if they want to talk to you specifically about it? Um, I, I myself don't don't have any, any of that stuff, but uh, we have a Total Package Hockey St. Louis uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, but you know, if, if a student athlete request more information for our center of excellence academy model and we put together some different virtual open houses and, and very educational things that, that they can that will be sent to them and if they if they're seriously considering it um then that that's the point where you know i get in touch with the family and we have that type of zoom or uh, virtual meeting um, with the student athlete and the family and, and really figure out if it might be the right path for them Great. Again, that's totalpackagehockey.com for anybody interested. And, and uh, for anybody who else wants to check them out on social media, I'll post the links with this show. So go over to letsgoblues.com slash radio, and uh, I'll have all the links for their social media channels. Phil, uh, this has been enlightening. This has been fun. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. And we'll have to do it again sometime down the road here. Oh, agree. Definitely. 100%. Uh, thank you, Phil. And um, I hope you and your family are staying safe. Thanks. You as well. And have a great day. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. You too. What are you doing? Why are you watching me right now? I, don't you know you can be podcasting Let's Go Blues Radio right now and check out a... a interview about somebody who's a prospect in the organization what are you doing why are you watching me get out of here go go go